After the first night of the RNC, differences between the two conventions were certainly on display. Republican Central Argument warned that a Biden administration would allow socialist policies to take hold in America. Florida businessman Maximo Alvarez compared Biden to Castro. Let's take a listen. I have seen people like this before. I've seen movements like this before. I've seen ideas like this before. And I am here to tell you, we cannot let them take over our country. I heard the promises of Fidel Castro, and I can never forget all those who grew up around me, who look like me, who suffered and starved and died because they believe those empty promises. Friend of the show, Kyle Kalinske, host of The Kyle Kalinske Show. He compares and contrasts the RNC with the DNC for us now. Welcome back, Kyle. It's good to see you, man. Great to see you, Kyle. Hey, good to see you guys, too. Absolutely. So immediate reaction to that speech, Kyle. It, it, I think I saw one of your tweets, and you were like, man, the Biden that they're painting is like wants to raise 80% taxes and all of that. I'm sure you're quite uh, sympathetic to some of that agenda, but it is largely disconnected from reality. And, I, you know, we've been quite critical of that socialist message here. What would you take away? I, you know, I'm just amazed. It's like they have one playbook that they go back to and it doesn't matter who their opponent is. It's just copy and paste every single election yeah, cycle. Right. And, you know, it, just go to Joe Biden's record. It, he so he wrote the crime bill. He didn't just vote for it. He wrote it. Um, he supported the Iraq war. He tried to cut Social Security multiple times. He, you know, supported the Patriot Act. He supported a bunch of these so-called free trade deals. I mean, the guy is effectively a moderate Republican. He prides himself on always reaching across the aisle. This is the kind of guy that he is. I mean, he worked with, he started his career by working with segregationists. So here you have somebody who's a Democrat in name only, and really he's a, really he's a moderate Republican, and he's still called, you know, a, a communist, socialist, Antifa puppet. And it's like, well, good luck trying to win the election when, you know, you're out in, in fairy tale land. This reminds mm. me a lot of what happened with Obama, how, you know, Wall Street hated him and they were scared by him. But meanwhile, this is the guy who bailed you out and then let you pay bonuses to the CEOs that bankrupted their companies. It's like it, the their perception of Democrats versus the reality couldn't be further from the truth. Yeah, I think that's a good point. So there was an interesting moment from Ronna McDaniel that I wanted to get your thoughts on. We actually played it earlier in the show as well, where she does some basically the same, like Biden's a Marxist socialist, whatever they say. But then she, I thought, fairly accurately laid out the case that was made for Biden at the DNC. Let's take a listen to what she had to say. If you watched the DNC last week, you probably noticed that Democrats spent a lot of time talking about how much they despise our president but we heard very little about their actual policies. Policies that would have been unthinkable a decade ago. Policies like banning fossil fuels, eliminating private health insurance, taxpayer funded healthcare for people who come here illegally and defunding the police. Their argument for Joe Biden boiled down to the fact that they think he's a nice guy. So I think she's basically right that that is what the DNC argument boiled down to is basically Joe Biden's a nice guy. We called it decency porn mm -hmm. here. Um, does that ultimately work, though? I mean, I think part of why Biden is in so much of a better position than Hillary Clinton was at this time is because people just generally like him a lot more than they liked Hillary Clinton. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that that's a fair point. Is it enough? We don't know yet. It's possible it's enough, but if it is enough, then all the wrong lessons are going to be learned. Hmm. So what Democrats are going to do is they're going to say Obamaism, Clintonism, neoliberal corporatism. It's obviously incredibly popular when the fact of the matter is people voted for Biden and the polls show this. This isn't Kyle Kalinske speaking. People voted for Biden simply because they were convinced he's the anti-Trump option that could win. Despite the fact that if you go through Biden's policies, they're a lot less popular than Bernie Sanders' policies were. So it's almost like people were propagandized into accepting Biden. But now what they're going to take away is if Biden wins, oh, obviously neoliberal corporatism is really popular. It's not. And so the real reason, you know, that Biden does have uh, a better chance than Hillary is because the Trump strategy is terrible this time around. Last time it was good. And yeah, because he's more likable of a person. But I mean— when I watched the DNC, 
all I saw was platitudes, cliches, Trump bad, and personal stories. And then, you know, you mix in a little bit of Cory Booker and some other people voter shaming and saying that non-voters are privileged. Mm -hmm. So they're not wrong. The the RNC criticism isn't wrong, um, but, you know, they're equally ridiculous, if not more ridiculous, in a slightly different way. (laughs) So that is an important point that you just made there about drawing messages, right? So from, like you said, from a potential Biden victory, the truth is that only two-thirds of the people, two-thirds of the people supporting Biden are doing so explicitly, quote, because he's not Trump. If you look at his polling data, they're, they're voting against something rather than affirming something. How does that work if he were to come to office, right? So it's like you said, you know, many of these neoliberals and the corporatists as well will say this was an affirmative vote for our agenda. But as soon as it crumbles at the ballot box, as it always inevitably does in some sort of midterm election or for something, some sort of legislation that they actually go for, are they going to learn their lesson or are they going to double down there, Kyle? They're, no, they're never going to learn mm. their lesson because, you know, th- this is like the same thing um, when there's a, a recession and then there's stimulus spending. You always have the same argument because the left says, oh, my God, we needed more stimulus in order to make this work better. And the right says, no, 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 we needed no stimulus in order to make this work better. You needed everything to kind of bounce back naturally. So it's the same thing when you have, you know, a a win in an election or loss in an election, for that matter. It's easy for for one group of people to say, oh, the problem is we didn't go left. And then another group of people to say, no, 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 the problem is we didn't go right wing enough. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my fear is that if Joe Biden, if Joe Biden wins, neoliberal corporatism will get all the credit. If Joe Biden loses, they'll blame Bernie Sanders and the left for not hopping on board. And people will say Biden and Kamala went too far left. They should have Mm -hmm. gone further right. So, you know, we're in this vicious cycle where everybody's just kind of restating their premise. And, you know, there's no there's no real reckoning with the failure of globalization and the current system. And I mean, it's devastating to see. And of course, the left is just always going to bend the knee and go right along. So we're in limbo in that sense as well. I think it's an important point. Uh, um, I wanted to get your reaction to to some of the specific speeches last night. In particular, Kimberly Guilfoyle gave a noteworthy address. Let's take a listen to a little bit of that. They want to destroy this country and everything that we have fought for and hold dear. They want to steal your liberty, your freedom. They want to control what you see and think and believe so that they can control how you live. They want to enslave you to the weak, dependent, liberal, victim ideology to the point that you will not recognize this country or yourself. Now, she Ooh. went on like that for quite a while, at <laughs> that level of <laughs> emphasis. Um, Kyle, your thoughts and feelings? Yeah, I, um, I kind of want to meet Kimberly Guilfoyle and Donald Trump Jr., because I want to know who their dealer is. Um, <laughs> I, think, uh, I think they were having some fun backstage. That, that's all I'll say about that. But, um, yeah, it's, uh, that was really fun to watch. I felt like she was yelling at me and that I did something wrong um, <laughs> and she was she was trying to discipline me. And I was like, Kimberly, please, I'm, I didn't do anything. Um, I think the problem is not just with Kimberly Guilfoyle, but the basically the entire night is that you're leaning way too much into the culture war, guys. You got to reel it in a little bit. This is like decidedly something that's not going to land with independents and normie voters This is totally like preaching to the choir, Fox News, One America News Network stuff where, yeah, if you're already a hardcore Trump person, you'll watch this and you'll cheer along. But if you're not, people are going to be like, this is the weirdest thing I've ever seen. Why are you yelling? I don't understand. (laughs) I think that's right, Kyle. It, but it's the thing is, funny enough, it's not even just Kimberly Guilfoyle. If you watch one of the so-called serious people like Nikki Haley in the speech she gave, she leads with Democrats obviously hate America. And then she goes on to like Biden is weak and Trump is strong. And it's like these themes that you're going with are ridiculous. And 
this isn't a, f- a concern of any working person across this country. They don't wake up in the morning. And go, oh, my God, Biden's so weak. What's he is he going to bend the knee to, you know, Russia or China if he's in power? No, people care about their wages. People care about covid. And, you know, I think the McCloskey's were probably the best example of this. They genuinely seem to believe that hordes of left wingers are going to lynch people in the streets. And, you know, my response to them is it's not hordes of left wingers that are killing you. It's covid. And you probably don't even want to wear a mask. And it's 170,000 people dead and counting. So it's just their their outrage meter is broken, and it's far too partisan, and they look ridiculous to anybody who doesn't already agree with them. Well, and here's, I think, part of the problem. We covered some of this polling yesterday is, like, that culture war stuff, it can work when you have maybe, like, a 40-60 issue where you're still the minority, but you got a good chunk with you. Um, it can work when your overall view of, like, where the economy is or whether to wear a mask or how coronavirus is going generally lines up with where independent voters are. And I think Trump had some of those issues in 2016. But this time around, there is such a massive gulf between the way that self-identified Republicans feel about the country and feel about Donald Trump and feel about the protests and all of that and the rest of the country and especially independents. And that's part of why when you watch this thing last night, it was just like you felt a little bit insane. It was so all over the place. Yeah, the best part of last night was actually the Trump parts because Trump was Mm. talking to frontline workers. And then there was one instance where he was talking to people that he nominally, you know, helped save because they were captured in other countries. And it's like, okay, at least this is, there's some normie connection here where the outside viewer who's not already drenched in politics can watch it and be like, Oh, okay. So he's, you know, he, he's showing concern or faking concern about frontline workers. But everything else was just you're way too in the bubble, guys. It's honestly it's embarrassing. And this one is not this isn't just a criticism for the RNC, because I felt the exact same way about the DNC. You know, Kamala giving her speech with a a giant smile on her face, you know, telling the stories of her childhood and everything. It's like, okay, we are we already know who you are. You ran for president and got like three percent. Reel it in a little bit. Nobody cares about your personal story in the middle of a pandemic and what is effectively a depression because the real unemployment rate is about 20 percent. So I think that this election, who can be the least insane is probably going to going to win this election. <laughs> yeah. I think that ultimately the Republicans have a harder mountain to climb, though, because, you know, I, I think their strategy is just so abysmal and Trump's showing no signs of hope. He's not doing the 2016 Trump strategy. So I think they have a, a harder mountain to climb. But, you know, if the Democrats can just appear non-insane and um, non-arrogant for like three and a half more minutes, then they could probably win. (laughs) Well, we'll see, Kyle. Well said, Kyle. Great to see you. Pleasure, guys. Mm -hmm. Former ambassador to the U.N. Nikki Haley. She was front and center last night. We're going to consider her performance and more as Rising continues.